Andy Cope, the Doctor of Happiness. A very warm welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Dan. I'm excited to be here. Can't wait for this conversation. We were just speaking, um, but before we hit record, and I think the Doctor of Happiness might be a little bit more happy than normal because your beloved Derby County have just got promoted. So yes, that, yes. that's a good thing, right? Well, it is a good thing. It's a rare thing as well, mate, because uh, we did lose twenty-one points and got demo- you know, relegated a couple of yeah, several times. So, yeah, I mean, it depends when you're listening to this podcast. But if you're currently listening to it as a Derby fan, I'm a very happy man, which is quite a rare thing for a Derby fan to be. <laughs> so, li- li- listen, Andy, I am super excited to have this conversation. Um, I don't think I've had in the um, forty odd episodes of the podcast. I don't think I've had anyone as more qualified and passionate and devoted to the subject of well-being and happiness as yourself. So can't wait to, to dig in. I'm, I'm really intrigued for, uh, and personally curious, and I know the listeners will be, to just to kind of for you to spend five, ten minutes or so talking about you, your journey, how you, how you kind of become the doctor of happiness and your uh, brilliant business, the art of brilliance that does um, some wonderful things about uh, well-being, et cetera. Take, take me on the journey and how you, how you got yeah, to where you are yeah, now. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah, a kind of accidental. I would describe myself as a recovering academic. So uh, I have got a PhD from Loughborough Uni in the science of human flourishing, so positive psychology. It's basically, for the, for the uninitiated, psychology traditionally, for 150 years of its being around, has been what we call a disease model. So psychologists, they're into phobias, disorders, anxiety, depression, paranoia, schizophrenia, trauma is the one coming through. So what psychologists have done for 150 years very nobly, I'm not dissing it in any way because I did it as well, is let's find out what's wrong with you and then let's try and put you right. So here's some therapy, here's Mm. some meds, here's some counselling, whatever. And I get that and I think that's fantastic. But what I realised in 2005 when my research kicked in, that despite 150 years of trying to do the best they can, psychologists, the best therapy, the best counselling, the best meds we can come up with, the truth is that mental ill health has been getting worse, not better. So it's been skyrocketing. You, 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 we, off air, we spoke about you having, you know, two daughters of teenagers. The number of schools I go into, mate, where kids are kids that that the median age of of uh, mental ill health is coming down and down and down. I, I can, I've met kids age nine on anxiety meds, and it doesn't fit right. It doesn't sit right with me because no. I think that, that right. it's like a, it's quite a toxic environment out there in the moment. So basically, what I did in two thousand and five, my PhD was to uh, what I realised that the, the huge thing that that psychology has been so predicated on looking at illness that it's never looked at wellness so it we've been so busy looking at how we can fix people we, we've taken our eye off the small minority who don't need fixing there's there's people out there with a smile on their face and a spring in their step and for you listening to this podcast i guarantee you can all think of a handful of people in your life who've got something extra an extra smile, an extra spring. They they like rock up on a Monday with a with a with a smile on the face, even on a Monday morning. It's a bit weird, really. These are your work colleagues who go the extra mile. You don't have to ask them ten times. It's just built into them. They create strong relationships. The business benefits are off the scale, but the but the personal benefits are, are bigger than that. So while the rest of psychology continues to look at the disease model, look at what's not working, look at the therapy and the counselling, I decided to flip it on its head and look at psychology from the other end of the telescope. Is like who are the happy people, right? Because that is really interesting. I think uh, psychology doesn't know the answer to that. So who, not only who are they, <laughs> but what are they doing that allows them to flourish? And thirdly, most importantly, the business that I've built and the books that I write are essentially taking the learning from them. What could we learn from people who are like buzzing with life and vitality that we could borrow off them, like ideas that they're doing that we could implement in our own lives, so we might also be buzzing with health and vitality. And although it sounds obvious when I say it like that, it's pretty much still a fairly new subject, is the science of mm. uh, human flourishing. So that's what I did. And mm. the PhD nearly killed me. Ironically, it made me unhappy, you know, because as a PhD, you've got to learn about data and analysis and all this uh, stuff. But what comes out of the research eventually, after 12 years of hard, hard academic labor, is some really kind of clear, simple, obvious, quick wins that will just raise your game. From I call it from, from mental health to mental wealth, is we all want that. We all want, I mean, my, my research people, the people I re- ended up researching, I call them two percenters. That might be a recurring theme of this podcast. Uh, so when you plot people on a graph of happiness and well-being, the two percenters, a small percentage of people at the top of that graph, the ones we've ignored on the grounds of them not being ill. 
so I call them the two percenters, they've got like 30% more happiness, they've got about 40% more energy than a normal human. And quite frankly, man, I, I call it not research, me search, I wanted to be one. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that's, um, there's a selfish element to these podcasts for me as well. I love getting this message out, but I take huge amounts of personal uh, learning and growth from speaking to people like yourself uh, 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 and other experts. It's definitely me, sir. Absolutely. And I having just going back to my two teenage daughters, I think I absolutely concur that I don't think it's ever been a stre as a stressful time for anybody, right? This is, social media, I think, is, has a big part to play with this. And I know you've got a wonderful course about detoxing off yeah. social media or what it, um, but, you know, and, and it, it's kind of chicken and egg for my kids. It's, you know, one of them is very, very artistic theatre, singing, and it's a way she expresses herself, but it's also a way that she affects her mental uh, w w well-being as well. So, I think I absolutely concur with you on on that stuff. And the rise of positive psychology can't be quick enough, fast enough, because we need to reframe this from broken people to, as you said, getting the best bits out of the happy people and understanding what the triggers are for that, and then learning off the off off, off the back of all of those. You've nailed it, mate. It's, but essentially, it's preventative. So what what positive psychology does, and again, I'm not putting the boot in because I think it's really valuable. No. Is they'll wait for you to break, and then they'll try and fix you. That's what psychology, right? If one of your daughters mm. has mental health issues, you've got to wait six months to get an appointment. But eventually, they'll sit down with a professional and try and piece them back together. And it costs a an, an ridiculous mm. amount of money and effort to wait till they're broken and then fix them. Positive psychology mm. is about it's more proactive. It's about if we could equip people with a very basic knowledge and skills to be able to take good care of their own mental health and well-being, then when the world does its worst, which it is at the moment, it's battering people. Right? You switch the news on right now, and it's grim. And, and work pressures, they're real, right? and the weather isn't always sunny. You know, it does rain on people. So the weather is, uh, sorry, the, the world is kind of quite toxic. So if, if we could learn how to look after our own well-being, then when the bad stuff does happen, which plot spoiler it will in everybody's life mm. is that you won't break. Mm. It's it's like mm. self care really. It's personal personal TLC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, we'll come back throughout the conversation, Andy, about some of the great work that you've got, your books and the courses that you that you offer. Which all, all the links and everything could be in the show notes for people to check out and see if this stuff resonates. So I think it's it, it's just brilliant work that you and your team uh, do on this i do want to uh, uh, and i think you know as much as this podcast and the work that i do is focused on retirement and, and helping people through one of the biggest transitions that they have both from a human point of view so kind of forget the money um and from a kind of true wealth or real wealth point of view which as you've rightly said is very holistic right wealth is not just the pound signs so um, as much as it's about that, I think what we've got to talk about today can be applied to many people in many stages of life. So I just want to kind of caveat that. But I will mention, obviously, the word retirement a lot. But I think most people can get a lot out of this. And, and I suppose the first thing I want to do, and we touched on it a, a little bit, I don't think it's ever been as in, uh, it's ever been more important to focus on your well-being and happiness as it is today given all of the pressures that you've rightly just said and how noisy the world is so i'm really curious to understand from you kind of um why do you think it's never been more important to focus on our well-being and happiness especially when it comes to these really crucial retirement years that people are entering entering into yeah you're right it is i mean happiness is the number one thing you want for your kids everybody listen to this it's the only it's the only thing you want it, it, but it, it, it permeates all ages it's and i think happiness the thing about um as you get a bit older and you and you look to retirement or you are at retirement age is essentially your happiness what you viewed as happiness will change throughout your life so if i was i'm 57 at the moment right so if i could whisper back to my 18 year old self and say do you know what when you're 57 mate friday night you'll love to stay in with your wife and watch netflix that'll be your best night right yeah. my 18 year old self yeah. will go yeah. you are joking yeah. you you yeah. you know you loser you've lost the yeah. you've lost the will to live and because i would have been out partying hard i would have thought that was a good night out so actually as you get a bit older you have this uh, essentially happen it's quite complicated really in, in terms of what trying to even define what happiness is because 
most psychologists wouldn't talk about happiness. They talk about, they call it subjective well-being. And subjective well-being means essentially what makes you happy won't make me happy. It's, a, it's in our own heads type thing. But happiness is a sort of a continuum from at one end of the happiness spectrum. There's this kind of manic woohoo, manic explosion of happiness. Um, and at the other end of the happiness continuum is this sense of quiet contentment, of living a life well lived of being happy with who you are and what you've achieved. And I think as you get to retirement, you're less woohoo and you go back. If you can find that quiet contentment, right, that is a life well lived. And that, it, it would be nice to have some money in the bank, of course, but that's, it's not really about that. It's about the relationships you build and uh, being happy with yourself, being happy with, with your lot. Yeah. I talk a lot about this and, and, um, uh, a great friend of mine who's been on the podcast, Brian Portnoy, who's wrote books called, um, or he's got a company called Shaping Wealth, wrote The Geometry of Wealth. He talks about funding contentment all of the time. And um, there's two types of happiness, isn't there, really? This is kind of like ex it kind of internal and external, so like experiential happiness, that one-time dopamine hits of things that kind of make you happy. But actually, do you know what doesn't cost a lot of money? That kind of internal foundational happiness, positive relationships, time outside, spending time with people that you want to spend with, um, you know, giving our time away to causes that 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 kind of we love and are passionate about, um, that kind of thing. And 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 I think it's I think the the experiential happiness, the, the one time dopamine hits, are often the things that people focus on because it's a bit more tangible. Doesn't take as hard a work to go. I'm going to go and. Uh, watch Derby County get promoted on the game and but but actually you know those one-time things but I do a lot of I have a lot of conversations and spend a lot of time with people thinking about the contentment side of happiness what are the foundational things that are really really important to live a life well lived yeah and I think obviously I'm not saying money is not important. Money is really important. There's, you know, you'll have covered it in 40 episodes about can money buy happiness or not. And without me going too deeply into that, uh, yes, it actually, you know, it helps. It can't buy happiness, but money can yeah. certainly buy, uh, it can buy choice. It can buy comfort. It can buy a couple of tickets to somewhere with palm trees. You know what I mean? So ha money's really, yeah. really important. Yeah. It gives you that safety net. Um, so it, you can buy it, but I, back to what you just said in terms of if everybody listening to this podcast, get a pen and paper and write down the top 10 happiest moments of your life, right? And there should be loads, but if you, it's really hard to do that. But if you did, I can fairly guarantee that there won't be any products on that list. It won't be the time you bought a big 40-inch TV. It will be time spent with people that you love doing very simple things and potentially with no Wi-Fi, but it will all be with very simple experiences with people you love. So in terms of money, in terms of buying a product, that's that also I'll give you the quick dopamine hit, but actually spending money on an experience. If you want to spend some money, then spend it on an experience with people you love. That's where you'll get your best bang for your buck. Yeah, I talk about that a lot, right? I think that, you know, people are... Um... People are so scared and fearful about running out of money that what they end up, they don't leave money on the table. They leave memories and experiences on the table at age 90 when they can't physically go and do them anymore with the people. And actually the people that they wanted to do with them, do them with are probably maybe not there or can't do it anymore. Um, you know, I think that's buying, buying memories and experiences should be the job of your hard earned money that you've spent multi-decades accumulating to give you that purpose to go and do that i really love what you said andy about thinking about the top 10 things that that have brought you happiness um and i think if you've done that and you're thinking about your retirement you can then extrapolate that forward a little bit so you go actually if these things have brought me happiness then surely that should that should bring me happiness in the future so how do i how do i do more of that over here yeah, I, I think, I th and I've, I've written about it in a couple of books, there's a big difference between your to-do list and your to-be list. So ever, but most people are manically yeah. crazy, crazy, busy doing, ticking things off your to-do list. And most people, you 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 know, you're a businessman, so am I. I've got so many things to do. I, I, I can get giddy trying to tick everything up. Into, I've got too many things to do. I can never get to the bottom of my to-do list. So, but well, that's what most people will go their entire life which is about 4,000 weeks, by the way, which is like nobody gets out alive. So you've got limited time, like headless chickens trying to tick things off our to-do list. And I'm sympathetic to that. However, where positive psychology is over the other side, it's, it's what I call your to-be list. So it's about a thousand times more important than your to-do list. But it, your to-be list requires a bit of 
honesty and courage to dare to point the finger back at yourself and say, right, who am I being while I'm doing those things on my to-do list? So am I being present, which is kind of quite rare in the modern days? Am I being kind? Am I being compassionate? Am I being loving? Am I being optimistic, hopeful, positive? Or am I accidentally in the modern world being stressed out, up to the eyeballs, anxious and and um, distracted? So I think a lot of this comes down to learning to be your best self, stepping into that best version of you that already exists, but the world's trying to knock you out of best self mode and into busyness. I love that. The, the, I've said it a few times on the podcast. There's this like 30 second rewind button that you can hit everybody listening. So hit that a couple of times and go back and to listen, just listen to that. Cause I think it's, <laughs> it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, I think if you can get into a mindset or speak to your spouse or family members or a professional or a coach or whoever you want to work with to talk about this stuff, it is truly transformational. I've seen it. You've seen it. I, Andy, you know, when people start exploring this, I, I, I also, um talk a lot about what, what i've coined the challenge of who and and I, i'm a i'm a fan of simon sinek's work you know start with why to a degree but i do think there's another layer here and i, I just i'm really curious to get your thoughts because i think it plays into what you just said i believe if we can discover who we were think about who we are and think about who we want to be so like the three dimensions of we need to go back a little bit we need to figure out who we are right now and then who we want to be. It comes to that kind of to be list that you want to do, but you might need to go back a few years to figure out some of the things you might need to kind of understand where we are now. I'm curious to understand if is that something that you've thought about that, you know, really trying to dig deep into who we are and who we want to be. Yeah. I think the truth is that we've all got this. Um, everybody's t there's a big talk about living your best life and being your best self It's you know, social media is a hashtag best life. But there's yeah. very few people yeah, yeah. living their best life, like genuinely being their best self. So what, all we're mm. interested is, I call it—I don't call it personal development, I call it personal remembering, right? Because we are amazing. We're all incredible human beings. But the world, we've got this collective amnesia. The world is so manic and so crazy and so full on that I haven't got time to be happy. You know what I mean? In fact, retirement, we call it destination addiction. It's like happiness is this sort of emotional pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So happiness, oh, we all want to be happy, right? So, and it starts really young. I'll, I'll give you, so, you know, when you're in primary school, what your teachers tell you, because they love you, they say, if you work really hard in primary school, you'll get really good SATS results. And when you get those great SATS results, guess what, kids? Then you'll be happy. And then you go to big school. Teachers are the same. And your parents, if you work really hard in year 11, right, you'll get really good GCSEs. And when you open that envelope, you'll be leaping around the hall, high-fiving your friends, because then you'll be happy happy then you'll have a job you'll have a sales target and when you hit your sales target then you'll be happy or well, classically you'll be happy when you're walking down the aisle with your perfect partner so what happens is most people are desperately kind of kicking this happiness into the long grass it's over there i've got to earn it i've got to pursue it. i've got to make happiness mine but it's it's in the distance whereas what we're talking about is what if that's totally incorrect right and what if happiness is um is at this end of the rainbow. What if it's already here, but we're just really bad at seeing it? So if we go back through the examples, what if it's the happiest primary school kids that do really well at SATs? So what if happiness is like good for your results? What if it's the happiest teenagers that overperform at GCSEs because happiness is good for your growth mindset and your learning and your motivation? What if it's the happiest salesperson that gets the most sales? Because it is. Or what if being happy now is the key to finding your perfect partner and walking down the aisle? So I think in terms of destination addiction, putting happiness off till retirement, I think we need to start right here, right now. That's where happiness always is. Um, it's right here, right now. It's just in the that we're blinkered. We don't see it. I, I mean, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I, I mean, well, I'll give you an I, example. I'll give you an example. Go for it. Give an, yeah. right? I did a session. I won't say which um, police force it was, but um, I think you can retire at a copper at age 55. And there's a I'm young lad there. What was he, 30? And he came to me at break. I was doing our flagship art of being brilliant with his police force. And he was a nice enough bloke, but he came to me at break time over a coffee. So he says, only 25 more years to go. You must hear this every day in your job, right? It's like, that is destination addiction. So I said, what do you mean? He says, well, in 25 years, I can be happy because I'll get my pension and I'll retire. I'm like, he's literally wishing his life yep. away. He's discounting this 25 years now and he's kicking up into the long grass. And I think, right, your job, 
is when people do get to retirement, they've got enough money that they can have a good life, all right? But don't take your eye off now. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I think I, uh, I sketch a lot that you've probably seen. And one of the sketches that I do with people live is when, when I start working with them, it's like, what do you see retirement as? Is it the finish line or the start line? Right? It's kind of, yeah. you know, because people, again, this destination, it's kind of, I've, it, it's a finish line of a thing that, and again, like you said, I've been, there's some ingrained beliefs through things that I've observed and witnessed and been told since the age of five, that when you get to this thing, it equals happiness. Well, if you're not happy entering it, you're not going to be happy, like going through it no, effectively. No. So, mate, um, mate, can, and it's that while mindset, it's in, while it? it's in my head. While it's in my head, right, let me Do give it. you a better example. Because, again, you're talking about this bit gets ingrained really early on. This is funny, but not funny. Right? So I, I write kids' books as well. So m many years ago, I got to um, be a guest author at a, a book festival in Halifax. Right? It's a bit of a backstory, but I won't give you all that. So I've got about, what have I got, 400 year five. So what are they, about nine years old? So every, every yep. nine-year-old in Halifax yep. is invited to this event. I'm one of the speakers, one of the authors. I'm sitting at the back waiting to be introduced. I'm sitting on this girl's table with these nine-year-old girls. And this little girl next to me, huffing and puffing and rolling her eyes. She's like, oh, like giving it all the histrionics. And I said, I said to her, what's up with you? She said, she says, I've had enough. And I said, what do you mean? You've only just arrived. What do you mean you've had enough? Not just today, she says. She, says, and she looks at me with these big brown eyes. She says, I can't wait to retire. I'm like, hang on. You're oh nine. She's nine years old, mate. In terms of that happiness rainbow, she's kicking her oh. happiness into the long grass about 65 years away. And I think so where, but my point made me think about while you were talking is where she learned that, right? She's learned that mm. from the big people. She's learned that from parents who are, and I, I love my dad, right? And he's still knocking around, but, and he's my hero growing up. But my dad would, would, would go out of the door on a Monday with a heavy heart and bounce back in on a Friday, clapping his hands. So even yeah. at, when I was five, I was subconsciously learning that Mondays are bad and Fridays are good, right? That put, you've got mm. to wait till Friday to be happy. And it's so ingrained. It mm. seeps in TGI Friday. Thank gosh it's Friday. And I'm like, well, let's reverse that. TGI Monday. Well, thank mm. gosh it's Monday. I'm still alive. I'm still here. If I'm going to rise, I may as well shine and give life a right good go. Yeah. Sorry. No, back, back to you. But I no, just couldn't. I, but honestly, the Halifax thing, honestly, so good. kids. That must have been your toughest gig. I would. I, I stand up and present <laughs> in front of a load of people. If I had to stand up and present in front of a load of nine-year-olds, I'd be terrified. Absolutely nine terrified. Are, nine are all right. Um, Fifteen-year-olds at the tough crowd, mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but I think yeah, absolutely true, right? And I think this is, you know, people have put so much emphasis on the date that they leave work to be the catalyst for happy life there was a study done uh, by the ons that i saw a couple of weeks ago that showed the decline of happiness so like you know happiness peaks it's a bit out of date now i think it finished in 2018 19 but happiness um tends to get really high when we're in our late teens kind of early 20s it falls during life because we work typically have children money worries come in and then it peaks up again like, uh, you know, as you go into retirement and as you're saying, it's kind of like there's obviously this just drudge of life that people are just putting themselves into a position that they're putting everything onto this kind of one day that they have no idea when it's going to be. They have no idea how long it's going to be for. Uh, and, and, and again, it's just ingrained, I think, but the financial service industry and uh, like have got a lot to answer for when it comes to this. They, they, they portray this wonderful life sitting on a beach at age 65 with uh, pounds in the pension fund and get to that point and we'll help you save and get to that point. They don't talk about well-being in a way that they should absolutely talk about well-being because you know the, the, the pounds in the bank and the day and, and the age that you have is, is, is where your happiness comes from. And I think it is a complete load of rubbish. So typically I say to people, look, if I can, if I can work with people um, early enough, great. But if you're thinking about retirement, I need to work with you for at least a three year running to you for you to make that make that decision properly and feel like you know what you're retiring to not necessarily everything about what you're retiring from yeah yeah good good no i think the, the well-being um tapping into the well-being there of, of your clients i mean that's what they really want is mental wealth mental wealth mm. and that and that like i said that's part part of having some money in the bank but it's part of knowing how to live your best life and and being your best self. It boils down to that, really. I mean, talking about being your best self, I, I had no idea. We went back to 2005. The world was very different when I started my PhD. 
living your best life and being your best self wasn't a thing. Anxiety hadn't been invented. There were no, people weren't anxious. In two, or it might have been, but they weren't talking about it in 2005. No. So I had no idea at the start of my research that I was going to actually accidentally stumble across the science of living your best life. I mean, this, it was news to me. Mm. I didn't know I was going to mm. make a career out of it. I didn't know I was going to write books about it. I was just researching it because I was curious. I had the, the question that launched my PhD, let me, let me give it to your listeners, right? Little question in my little Derby head. Um, must have been 2004 in my head. Could you be happier even if nothing in the world around you changed? Right? So just now, it's not a trick question, but just let that rattle around a couple of times. Could you be happier even if nothing in the world around you changed? Because my answer, Dan, to me was yes. All right? So, and this is a really weird admission because essentially what I was saying to myself is I had the potential to be happier. The world didn't need to change. I had the potential to be happier, but I, I wasn't being. And therefore, the biggest thing, the biggest barrier to me feeling amazing was actually me. All right. So it wasn't the boss and it wasn't the weather and it wasn't the train strikes. The, 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 actually, there's something I could do. I just wasn't being as happy as I could have been. I thought it might just be me. So I, I was happening to do a, a conference a couple of days later. So I had asked about 300 people that saying, because I was curious, by the way, folks, could you be up here? Even nothing in the world around you changed. And out of that audience of 300, about 290 hands sort of went up. They were looking perplexed because they'd never thought about it before. But they were going, yeah, yeah, we could actually be. So therefore, what my PhD was about is about helping you get out of your own way. <laughs> You're blocking your own sunlight here, people. So I essentially found out a bunch of what I call intentional strategies. So it's not about what's happening outside of you. You know, it, if you think about my two percenters, my happy people, they live in exactly the same external world as everybody else. So their train gets cancelled. It rains on them as well. But they have these what I call intentional stra intentional strategies. These mostly habits of thinking. So, for example, they're not kicking their happiness into the long grass. They're not. Yeah, you know, they they are excited about the holiday, but they're also equally excited about today. I think it, again, it, it's um, it's a wonderful way to start reframing this. And and I'm I, I'm interested. And you, you've 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 kind of talked a little bit, well, quite a bit about this, but uh, let, let's kind of try and maybe summarize a bit of this. I think would be really interesting. So we've talked about positive psychology, um, but how how can that how can we use positive psychology to help us reframe a number of those internal and learnt beliefs? Because that's kind of what we've been saying, isn't it? It's kind of the the learnt belief yeah. is if it rains on us, we should be miserable. But the two percenters in your world, <laughs> it rains on them, and they've got. They've they've rewired their internal and learnt beliefs to a way to make them go. Well, we'll just move forward with this. So is you know, right. I think yeah. it's really interesting that topic in general, and that and that applies to anyone entering into retirement as well. Right, mate. Here we go. This is I mean, this is proper deep, but let's keep it simple. Let me tell you a quick story, right? I don't know how much time we've got, but um, beliefs, right? Beliefs are so powerful, and people die for their beliefs. So I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but. Um, a belief is what you've got in your head, your model of the world, right? But now the, your beliefs aren't true, but you really think they are. So this is, let me just go with it. Let me give you, an, let me give you a quick story. So again, it does appear in one of the books, but a true story. How do you, ca how do you catch a monkey? How do you catch a baby monkey? All right. So assuming you own a zoo and you needed some monkeys for the zoo, what they actually do, how you catch a monkey, you go into the, let's fly into West Africa, into the rainforest. And the monkey catcher will take, go into the rainforest. They'll take a spade, a cage and a bunch of bananas. So you go into the forest, you take a cage, a spade, a bunch of bananas, they'll dig a hole in the forest floor, they fit a cage into the hole, put a banana in the cage, and then whoever set the trap will go and hide behind a tree. Right? And they wait there and they wait until eventually the monkeys come through the forest and one of the monkeys in the troop runs over the cage, it looks down, it sees the banana and it thinks, I like bananas, right? So the monkey puts its hand in the cage and grabs the banana. But the cage has been very cleverly designed so it can get its hand in. But once it's made a fist and grabbed the banana, it can't get its hand out again. So now the monkey is perplexed, right? Because it's got the banana in the cage and it can't work out how to get it in its mouth. Now, apparently, as soon as the monkey grabs the banana, it's doomed, right? Because whoever set the trap doesn't have to creep out really quietly. You can come out as loud as you like going, yay, fantastic, gotcha, lifetime in zoo for you. Because, Dan, the monkey would rather hang on to the banana and get captured rather than let go. Now, I know that's a bit of a weird, like, where's it going with that? But <laughs> no, in terms of how many bananas have we got in our heads, right? How many, yep. how many thoughts, as everybody listening, how many thoughts 
I've, do you continue to think that aren't serving you well, but you continue to think those thoughts? And even worse, how many of those thoughts then manifest in behaviors and those behaviors are not serving you well, but you continue to do those behaviors? So part of being your best self and living your best life, for sure, I can teach you a whole load of new stuff. Human beings are really good at learning new stuff, right? But we're really bad at unlearning right so to be your best self of course you need to learn some new stuff but equally and what you're alluding to you've got to let go of the bad stuff you've got to stop i mean self-harm is a strong word but if most people have got a voice in their head if you spoke to anybody else how you speak to yourself in your head you wouldn't have any friends right we're beating ourselves <laughs> up all the time <laughs> and we and we've got yeah. so many riddled with bad habits but the unlearning piece the letting go understanding what your personal bananas are and stopping doing them that is much harder to do than learn a whole load mm. of new stuff but you've got to do it that, mm. it's the unlearning that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> that's important yeah no I absolutely and actually j just to kind of come back to a point we made a bit earlier on right we, we're talking about money buying happiness and in retirement what to do with money one of those bananas that people hang on to because they've learned is to not spend their money right they've had this this years yeah. of a of a habit of saving they've witnessed their parents not spend their money and their grandparents not spend their money typically because people are really scared about running out of money when there's no more money coming in yeah. so the, the learned belief is there not to spend it and we know all the stats are telling us that on average people only spend about 30 percent of their money in retirement by the time they get to 90 because they're more fearful about running out of money than they are about wasting their life and yeah. that's a banana that they're hanging on to um, yeah. and and we and and i do huge amounts of work and spend a huge amount of time with people um, and it's not a one and done thing right you're not going to do this in one conversation because i we're trying to unwire 30 years of stuff yeah. that people have observed and witnessed but you know, when you start saying, you know, there are things you can do with your money, spending your money on um, new and novel experiences with the people you love will make you happy. Giving your money away will make you really happy, by the way. That's proven in science. Yeah. Um, and buying your way out of doing things that you don't like doing and suck up your time. So let's figure out how we can not hold on to those bananas and we can make sure we do. I mean, it's that is such a, an important thing to understand, right? In order for us to let go of those and, and enjoy life. Yeah. Well, people will die clutching bunches of bananas, won't they? With all the riddled ingrained habits oh, of thinking. Often absolutely. our thinking isn't in our thinking. It's passed down from our parents and grandparents. Essentially, you're, right. you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, rethinking yeah. how you think, yeah. and but letting go of bad habits, that's the hard part. Is, um, what I'm trying to say is that's the harder to do than it is to learn. I could get you, it's easy. We're so good at learning, but so bad at unlearning. Yeah. Well, the, bra the brain is, uh, you know, you'll know this better than me, but the brain doesn't like to burn calories, right? It's a lazy thing. We need to be intentionally <laughs> kind of doing stuff. So the brain will always go to the easiest thing that it can possibly do, <laughs> and that's probably taking more information rather than dealing with the baggage that it's holding yeah. on to. So... We need to be think, really intentional, right? Yeah, so I think so, I don't know if it's true, but somebody, you know, lots of people, psychologists say we have got about eighty thousand. We have about eighty thousand thoughts every single day, but about seventy-five thousand of those thoughts are the exact same thoughts you had yesterday and the day before. <laughs> so actually, we haven't got any new <laughs> thoughts creeping in. We just get we get grooved into mm. your brain that yeah. thought, that trigger. So actually, we're back yeah. to rethinking your thinking, creating new pathways. Neuroplasticity means now, however old you are, your brain will still shape. It's like play-doh. It can learn loads of new stuff. But I, and I think maybe in terms of, uh, I think pushing the comfort zones a little bit, I think as you get older, and I find myself doing this, is you do like your routines and you do like your habits. They make you feel safe and comfortable. And daring to push it a bit, actually, daring to go to new places, daring to try new things, daring to try new foods. I think that's part of, like, it won't always work, but you're pushing it a little bit. Um, and I think that's quite quite neat. But you, obviously, as you get older, you've got your favourite holiday destination, you've got your favourite pub meal, and I get I get all that. But just shake it up a bit, vary it a little bit, have a yeah, yeah. you know, have a bit of adventure in your life. Yeah, I say the two most powerful words in retirement are yes and no. Right, you say yes to scary growth stuff. Because we yeah. need to make sure that we, you know, yeah. our, our brains are wired to move forward, right? We like, as human beings, we like to, we do like to learn new things, but sometimes we get a bit lazy with it. So say yes to new things, try them. Doesn't mean that you're on that road forever. If you don't like it, you haven't enjoyed it, go and try something else. 
and then say no to things that you don't want to do. Because again, if we're thinking about our mental well-being, one of the challenges I see for people in retirement is that they believe they've now got all the time in the world. They need to fill their time because they haven't come up with a good time plan. So they end up saying yes to a load of stuff that they don't want to do. And it really, really annoys them. And, and so we need to learn to say no better. I think as actually as a general population, that would help our well-being a lot more if we say no to things we don't want to do. But yeah, I think that's 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 really important. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Say yes to there's something in positive psychology called Dunbar's number, which basically says that you spend about 60 percent of your entire life with a really small circle between um, 12 and 15 people. So this is your tribe. It's your clan. It's your it's your bet. It's your absolute closest family and friends. So we've all got between 12 and 15 people. 60 percent of your life is spent with those people. I would say yes to those people. All right. I would say yes to spending more quality time with those people and no to a lot of the other stuff. If 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 you if people yeah, are asking yeah. you stuff and they're not in those twelve to fifteen, then particularly as you get older, surround yourself with those twelve to fifteen because that's where your happiness will be with strong personal relationships yeah. with those twelve people. Yeah, what a great tip. And that and I mean I've read a lot about the Harvard eighty five year study and I quote it a lot on the podcast, right? It's you know, the number one determinant of a happy and long life is the yeah. quality of your relationships, the positive relationships. Not diet not food not all of that you know exercise it's the quality of your relationships um and i totally agree find your tribe and say yes to doing more stuff with those guys and girls yeah fabulous in terms of um uh, just just one 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 quick thing so i'm sure we'll wind it up in a minute i think again it's an it's an old thing as we get a bit older is the power of presence the power of um actually being there I read some stuff, I don't know if you saw it, the Louvre, the museum in Paris, published some data on the Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa, which is the most kind of famous painting in the whole world. Apparently, what they did was they measured the queue, right? It's about one hour 15 on average to get to queue to see the world's most iconic artwork. And do you know how long people stay there? So they've queued for an hour and 15. They stay there on average for 17 seconds. So what they'll do, what they'll do is they'll rock up at the Mona Lisa, <laughs> so they'll look at it, they'll then turn yeah. their back, they'll do a selfie, 17 seconds later, they've gone, right? And I think oh. that it's this power of presence, this power of doing nothing, this almost, the, the Dutch have got a word, uh, Nixon. Nixon is deliberately setting out to do nothing. And and so and it's really hard in the modern world because we're so distracted. So I think as we become a bit older and we are retiring is lingering in the moment. You know, when you go to the Mediterranean on a holiday and, the, and you go to the town square, the village square, there's always a bunch of old people sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> All right. Oh, just, yeah. Yeah. And that yeah, is it. That yeah. is happening. Learn to love right? that. That's that contentment. Yep. That's the contentment that I spoke about earlier. That's not woohoo, crazy yep. dancing around with jazz hands, but they are so happy Absolutely. doing nothing. Yep. And I think the Brits, we, we almost like, if I, if you tried to do 10 minutes of sitting and looking out of a window, you'd go crazy with, with agitation. Yep. That you think you should be doing something. And I think this yep. quietening ourselves down, being present with the people we love and actually deliberately being at ease with doing nothing is quite a skill yeah absolutely i just want to spend a couple of minutes on this because i think it's so crucial right it comes back to the point how i think happiness has evolved over the last 20 30 years and how it's evolved i think over the last six or not maybe not happiness. how things being present has evolved over the last six or seven years there's nothing more than winds me up right and i'm a massive sports fan i play golf i play cricket i've done you know i, I love my sport there's nothing more than wise me up than watching on telly people watching golf with their phones out, taking instead of being present, you know, they're, they're, they're in the crowd. There's Tiger Woods, there's Rory McIlroy, and they're not even watching the thing. They're more concerned about getting it on camera than being present in the moment. And I just think that has moved on so rapidly in such a short space of time that we have no idea how to cope with it as human beings. And like you rightly said, the power of doing nothing and being present with no distraction and sitting and thinking, like it's a sad, sad world where that has been lost. So I'm really interested, just a couple of minutes from you about how that's evolved, why it's done what it's done and why we just, you know, why these social media companies know how to get us addicted to this stuff and how important it is just to take that downtime. 
Dan, I love the passion, mate. I love Maybe the passion, that's a whole mate. new episode, Andy, well, isn't I love it? the passion, yeah. <laughs> But, but you're right, people are so busy trying to capture the moment that they're completely missing the moment. But of course, we only want to capture oh, it so we can you share just, it. You and... just said it in about 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but we want to capture it so we can share it so everybody else thinks we're living the life. Look at me uh, with Rory McIlroy you doing it. Yeah. And it, it, because social media is attractive, you know, you, you, your life, you want to put it on your show reel. Look how good everything is. But you never, you never post your bad mm. days, do you? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Social media's got a lot to answer for, I think, and it's, I call it anti-social media, actually, particularly Twitter as a football fan, mate. You go on Twitter at five o'clock oh. if your team's lost. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, the anger, the bile. It, yeah. it, there's, so, there's so many angry yeah. people out there. And I think, I think maybe yeah. we leave you listeners with this. I think in the modern world, if you want to be that best version of you, actually, quite often it's looking around what, what everybody else is doing and not doing that. The, the, the screen time, the, the, the social media is another banana. We need to let go of some of that and if we and all that time that we save that we're not doom scrolling we invest that time with our 12 people then that maybe is uh, the secret to happiness right there i think that's a wonderful place to end such a brilliant conversation i think we could probably speak for about i reckon we could do a whole season of the podcast just me and you right i mean there's so much to talk about um so thank andy i i appreciate your time massively um i love the work you're doing um i'm going to put links to all of this into the show notes you've got some great um kind of workshops coming up thinking about behavior and leadership and social media detox and uh, the art of being brilliant which every I, I really want to be brilliant so that's that's really cool you know and i think it, it's so important the work you're doing so i put all the all all the uh, all the notes on there as well as your books which are uh, which are phenomenal so the Thank you for coming on. Thank you for the work you're doing. And yeah, really appreciate it. Well, right back at you, mate. Thanks for being interested. Really, really appreciate that. Um, as I say, links to everything Andy's been doing um, uh, throughout his wonderful career be on the show notes. Please go and check them out. Go and buy the books on Amazon. The links are on the website. The courses are there. Um, so, so, so please do. And thank you once again for everybody listening in to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Until next time, take care.